Welcome to Rain, the real estate investor growth network with your hostess, Jen Josie. Join like minded real estate investors and accelerate your business towards greatness. You will hear step by step strategies for success, interviews with real estate rock stars, and we will dig deep into past projects where we bear it all, including the good, the bad, and some just plain ugly. So get excited. Here's the bestower of badassery herself, the real Jen Josie. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Jen Josie, creator of Rain, the real estate investor growth network. Whoop, whoop. On today's episode, we have a guest that will be sharing their badassery. But before we begin, here's today's badassery bestowment, my little badass gift to you. Today's topic is the importance of working with an investor-friendly attorney. As a real estate investor, it's crucial to recognize the significant role of an investor-friendly attorney can play in your investment journey. These specialized attorneys are not only well-versed in general real estate law, but also they have a deep understanding of the specific needs and challenges faced by investors. Here are four reasons why working with an investor-friendly attorney is important. Number one, expertise in investor-specific issues. Investor-friendly attorneys have a grasp of the unique aspects of real estate investing, such as creative financing, syndications, joint ventures, and tax considerations. This expertise is invaluable in navigating complex transactions and structuring deals in a way that maximizes your benefits and minimizes risk. Number two, proactive problem solving. These attorneys can foresee potential legal hurdles and provide solutions before these issues escalate into major problems. This proactive approach can help save you time, money, and stress in the long run. Number three, network and resources. Investor-friendly attorneys often have a network of other real estate professionals like brokers, lenders, and inspectors, which can be a valuable resource for you. They can connect you with other professionals who understand the investing landscape and can contribute to your own success. Number four, risk management and asset protection. Real estate investments come with their own set of risks. An experienced attorney can help you in setting up the right business structures like LLCs for asset protection and advise you on insurance and other risk management strategies. So remember, the cost of hiring an investor-friendly attorney should be viewed as an investment in your business's future success. Their guidance can be invaluable in navigating the complex legal landscape of real estate investing, helping you to make informed decisions and avoid costly mistakes. Now on to today's episode of the Real Estate Investor Growth Network podcast. We have with us David Randolph. David's extensive knowledge and success in the area of buying, rehabbing, and selling houses fast is what makes David one of the United States most sought after short sale and rehab experts. David's biggest passions are procedures, profits, and people. As the CEO and founder of Short Sales Profits, he helps people of all walks of life leverage the power of tangible real estate tools so they can stop worrying about their future and start enjoying the lives of their dreams. It's my pleasure to have him on the show, so welcome, David. Woo-hoo. 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 So good to see you again. You have a paid audience. They all clap. <laughs> I do. I pay them very well. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting you at the REUP conference by our good friend Noah Harris down in Columbia, South Carolina. So shout out to Noah. Hopefully he'll do some more of those REUP conferences. They are awesome. And you blew me away on stage because I don't know a lot about short sales and I still feel like there's so much more for me to know. So I'm thrilled to have you here. But before we get into all that, Tell us how you got involved with real estate. There was a little homeschool action going on before you got involved with real estate. So I want to hear all about this. Well, sure. Yeah, Jen, I'm really honored to be here and and to be on your podcast. 
I really appreciate what you do for the community and, and society, you know, in America. So it's really an honor to be here. But yeah, you know, I, I'm like a lot of other people 14 years ago, working and slaving away for somebody else, you know, at the corporate job. Um, you know, even, you know, uh, homeschooling came into it because, you know, the public school system was falling apart in, in our location, our area. And so we were homeschooling our kids, you know, during that time. I'm working in a corporate job and I'm doing these patents and I'm developing these things for the company. You know, I, my background is engineering. And then I'm told one day that, well, you uh, will never get a raise again. And I'm like, well, what <laughs> does that mean? And they said, well, we have a policy. Nobody can get paid more than the, than the president of our, of our small company. <laughs> And I'm like, well, give him a raise, for goodness sakes, you know. And, and so I hit me square in the head that, oh, my gosh, I'm climbing up the wrong ladder. And the problem was, Jen, I got to the top and almost fell off. Wow. There's nothing at the top, Jen. There's nothing that's at the top but a cliff. So at least I climbed back down. And my wife and I took my wife took me to a three day real estate conference. OK, and that's where I learned about real estate. And this is 14 years ago. I didn't know anything about real estate. And I went to that for three days and I'm like, oh, my eyes were so opened up. The possibilities of uh, of being able to have freedom in life and not to work for somebody else, not to. I mean, I was making my company that I worked for a lot of money. And, and there is ways in real estate, you know, that you could help people out. In, in life, and then you could help your family out too. And so that three-day real estate conference just made me fall in love with real estate. And after that, you know, it's a long story from there. <laughs> but you did, you were homeschooled, you, did you retire? Did you just leave or? Well, what happened was, um, you know, we were homeschooling and, you know. In addition kind of, to working your full-time job? Yes, oh, right. See, I missed that part, right. okay. So that that was a hard part. And so we reached this point where, you know, our my family, our family, my wife and I's family was more important than working. And so we had managed to get out of debt. So we had been taking everything that we were working for and then paying off all of our debt that we had. And so then we got to a point where basically that I was able to retire from that job. OK, so we had saved our money up. We would gotten rid of the debt and we weren't rich at all. We just didn't have any debt. We don't have any debt. Life really changes. And, you know, when you're working for another company, you're perpetually in debt because if you don't keep working, they don't pay you. That's right. right. And stuff. And so uh, and so that's where basically I was able to stop and homeschool my kids. But Jen, there was a real problem. They graduated. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and they went off to college. And, and I looked at my wife and she looked at me and it's like, well, what are we going to do now? And, and that's when we thought, well, Got we're it. going to. They, they we're going to take this real estate training and knowledge and we're going to go into real estate, you know, full time because it wasn't like a job. OK, so I could say full time, not from the you know what most everybody out there in the corporate world is stuck doing, but rather a choice to work full time to do real estate, to help families out in their situation. As you know, you know, I learned how to do short sales from the very beginning. And in 2008 and nine, it was a crisis in this country. Foreclosures were everywhere. The banks were stealing their ha the houses from the homeowners. They were literally not following any regulations or rules. And and, and and the homeowners didn't know, you know, what the guidelines and regulations were. And so, you know, we were, my wife and I were able to step in and, and learn the short sale method to stop that foreclosure and to be able to get them, you know, time in the house and a bunch of other things that we can go through. But, you know, that was basically, you know, um, a way for us to, you know, take, you know, uh, our our lives that we could earn an income and give back to society by helping families. I love all that. And sorry, I was confused on where that fit in there because I'm a former teacher. So I always, you know, hear about homeschooling. I want to hear about it. And the coaching program that I coach for is called Homeschooled, <laughs> but it teaches about uh, flipping houses. But anyway, I want to start diving into short sales now. And this is something where I know just enough to be a little dangerous, but I don't know if I could ever like go through and buy a short sale or even if you it's called buying a short sale or whatever. So I need you to start from the basics for me. Dumb it down for me. What is the real definition of a short sale? Oh, boy. Uh, this is going to blow everybody's mind. If you ask an entire room full of uh, people or even real estate investors, 
what is your one sentence definition of a short sale, almost everybody's going to say it's when you owe more than what it's worth. Right. Right. You have a house. They've got a loan on it. They're not able to make their house payment. And so they're 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 they lost their job or many, many reasons we can get into later, but they can't make their payment and the bank is basically going to take their house. Well, you know, most Americans would just sell their house or refine, you know, do whatever. But if you owe too much money, then you can't pay off the loan. So it's a catch-22. And now right. homeowners are you know, given the shaft, right? Well, basically, so so therefore, back to the definition that most people would say, what's well, when you owe more on the loan than what you can sell the house for? But that's wrong. That's not the definition. Not in my world. See, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a real estate investor. I am the buyer and the negotiator. So in when we start talking about short sales, we're talking about you, your audience, being the buyer of the house and the negotiator with the bank. This is not you buying one off of the MLS with a realtor. No, no, no. Okay, the realtor is not trained properly how to do a short sale, right? Okay, but an entrepreneur is and can be trained and learn that, and then they take care of it. So back to the definition. The real definition of a short sale is they miss one house payment. Hmm. That's it. You, if they miss a payment, Jen, you can do a short sale on the house. It's irrelevant how much they owe. I know that's mind blowing. It's irrelevant how much they owe. Now you're like, well, how can that be, David? Well, I will quote you a, a company called Black Knight. They're a statistical mortgage company. They Wait, gather what? All- Say that one more time. Black Knight. What? Black Knight is a company. That's the name of the company, and they actually changed to the name ICE. And I have no idea what ICE is, but I know Black Knight is their name of the company that gathers all the mortgage data in the country. So the delinquent loans, FHA loans, all this data. And so they collate this and they publish it. Well, Black Knight did this study over 30 years wow. of foreclosures. This every foreclosure in America for 30 years. And they looked at all the homes, Jen, that had 40% equity, 40%. They could have snapped their fingers and sold that home on the MLS instantly, easily. But what happened was one third of those went to foreclosure. You weren't there, there, Jen. I wasn't there. Other people weren't there to help them out and keep them out of foreclosure. And so therefore, that is your potential short sale. Well, that Mm -hmm. homeowner says, I'm done. I don't care what you do. Okay. You know, just get me out of this situation. Get me more time in the house. Don't let them come after me for the debt. You know, um, you know, don't hurt my credit. You know, don't let it hurt my credit. All these other things you you can do, and we can talk about later. But if they say, you know, I don't care what you do, go ahead and do a short sale. That really is what I call the definition of a short sale. Because now, when I can buy a house for twenty nine thousand six hundred dollars that was owed two hundred and four thousand wow. dollars that I sold for 275, okay, in public records, 275, it's not about how much you owe. If I can go from 204 to 29,600, almost call it flipping the bank, right? You know? All right. But you know, if you can do that through the short sale method, that's what I do, okay? That's what I teach other people to do across the country. That's the real definition of a short sale. Okay, so obviously these are the properties that you're going after, but what if there is a property that does owe more than the value of the property? The, we're not we're not talking about those. Well, sure, no, absolutely, still because in that case the homeowner has no choice but to work with you. Okay. They have no choice but to ask for your help because there is no other solution. You know, other people, you know, somebody, you know, a homeowner if they had the ability to do it, they could uh you know, fix the house up and sell it. You know, they could do all these things that that us real estate investors do. They could become a real estate investor, but they don't have that uh, ability to do it. Okay, and so therefore, they you know, if, if they owe too much, they're in the catch twenty two. Okay, everybody agrees that they owe too much. Then they're clearly work with somebody that knows how to do short sales because that's your only out that you have. Okay. Okay. You know, so your- I'm still confused on what a short sale is. I, I understand it's a house that has missed a payment, but are you buying a short sale? Is a, is it the pr- process called a short sale? Like what, explain exactly that, that aspect sure. of it. 
Yeah, sure. So, so basically, the homeowner um, has missed a payment. Now, in some cases, you know, the homeowner might want to stay in the house forever. And in some cases, they're like, no, I, I want to move. It's a divorce. Um, I've got health issues. I can't, you know, the homeowner doesn't want the house anymore. It, it could be so, a house that was left to a niece in Florida and the person passed or something. You know, 25% of short sales today are probate. Wow. Okay. Pre-pandemic, it was 5%. Goodness. Okay. Today, it's 25% are exactly what you said, the niece, and they inherited a house and stuff like that. So there's, it and doesn't matter. There's, it's a financial burden for that niece too. So you can come in and really help them out of a difficult situation here. It's an emotional burden too, got it. because okay. they're, they're, they got the banks trying to take the house away from them. They got all the contents of their grandmother in the house and things like that. But anyway, the, the point is that it's, so real estate investors, we buy houses, we fix them up and sell them, we buy them, fix them up and rent them out. Or sometimes we just buy them and sell them to somebody else who can fix them up, right? That's, you know, there's different ways as as us real estate investors. So what happens is the homeowner, the one that missed the payment, they basically need to sell the house. They need to get rid of it. So you are the buyer. So you're going to be buying the house. But because the loan is 204000 I can't buy it for that price. It's It's too high. Okay, and so what happens is the short sale process now, which is federal, by the way, it is identical across the United States. Okay. The process of short sale then is me going to the bank and then doing these steps with the bank to get the ultimate response back after all the steps is that, yes, the payoff figure for that house is $29,600. Here's a letter given to the title company from the bank that says my payoff for the seller is now $29,600. And so that's basically what happens. I'm buying the house for that. Now, in this case, the seller doesn't get paid money because the bank took a loss, okay? So so the bank will let the homeowner get $3,000, which is a lot more money than they would get if they you know, are underwater and they can't sell it for what it's worth, right? And so basically you can get them some money to move from the bank, you can get them a lot more time in the house because a short sale process does take two months, three months, four months, six months to do. And that's and that's all that time they're in the house able to save their money up. Jen, that's the number one reason a homeowner actually will go with you and let you do a short sale is because you are going to get them that time in the house to be able to save their money up to start over, to be able to find a place to move to. That's actually the number one reason that they will want to have you stop that foreclosure date and then start into the short sale process of the negotiation with the bank and everything we can talk about you know, later. But you're the buyer, they're the seller, the price... Uh, the, the the loan value is too high. You get the bank to understand that it's too high, so they reduce it down to a low number like twenty nine thousand six hundred. Issue an approval letter to the title company, and you can come to closing like any normal transaction with this approval letter. You know, buyer and seller show up and sign the documents, and then the buyer owns the house. Okay, so. What was the value of this property? the The loan was two hundred four. Would you say? Yes, two hundred four thousand. Two hundred four thousand, and then they have already paid off most of that and are down to twenty nine. Or they that's just what the well, what you I, negotiated I think, with the bank. I think the original loan was maybe two sixty, but the the current Got amount. It. Left on the loan was 204. Owed at that time for that person, yes, was 204. Okay. And so you go in and negotiate with the bank to get it, a payoff amount of 29600 They forced me to pay that, yes, Jen. In writing, they, they said, if you want to buy this house, you have to pay 29600 I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're buying it for $29,600. Um, and you're to the bank, but you are also, and just with a good heart, you are giving these homeowners, would you say $3,000 in moving expenses? And Well, no, I'm not allowed to give them any money. That's, oh. that's called bribery. Okay. okay. And so what it is, is I, it's not that I make the bank. I don't have any control over the bank. Remember, they're a 600 pound gorilla, but the bank will, per regulations and policies that I'm aware of, I will make sure that they give the homeowner $3,000 for moving expenses because okay. it's a FHA guideline or it's a 
Fannie Mae guideline. And so that will be on the the um, the, the approval letter, okay, that says 29,000, says that the that the seller gets three thousand dollars, you know, to move. It says who the buyer's name is. You know, it has to be the buyer has to be approved. It's not just any buyer, which is very good because you know when you get a price of twenty nine thousand six hundred, the the homeowner, the seller, kind of says, "Well, hey, can my sister buy the house?" Right. right. I mean, that's <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But 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 what you say is, "Oh no no." For, well, first of all, there's two reasons why that's a no no is because. The bank, you, nobody related to the seller can be involved in the transaction. Okay, huh. so so nobody that you know you can't sell the house uh, to your sister, brother, or any relative. So the seller can't get any benefit whatsoever because the bank is taking a two hundred thousand dollar loss, right? right? So so the seller can't, you know. Uh, and here's the other thing: you can't you as the buyer after you buy it, you can't sell it back to them. You can't rent it back to them. It's federal law. You both go to jail. Yeah, it's actually a law, not a a guideline or a suggestion. But uh, you know, in two thousand nine, you know, uh, you know, foreclosures and short sales were so prevalent uh, at that time that they passed a federal law saying that the homeowner who uh, you know the, the bank takes this loss that the homeowner can't come back and buy the house back, you know, for say fifty thousand, you know, or you can't rent the home back to them. They can't benefit you know, uh, from that house. And so they have to go to another house, you know, go somewhere else uh, with that. So, all right, just being devil's advocate here, because I have so many questions and I'm thinking like on the flip side of things, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the homeowner and the struggles that they're going through. So they owe 204,000 on this mortgage and they got one payment behind and now they're, they're, you know, they, they can't catch up. They're struggling. You go in and talk to the bank and negotiate this much lower price because you are an authorized buyer. Correct. Correct. Yes. Correct. And so why wouldn't the bank go back to the homeowner and say, listen, we'll get, you know, we'll let you sell this house and you just have to pay off a hundred thousand. Like, why isn't the bank doing this? They're losing, you know, almost 200,000. Why aren't they just giving a chance to that homeowner to go list it for lower or whatever to get out of it and then just be at a hundred thousand? for example. Because the bank, the 600 pound gorilla, they sent out uh, what is called either an appraiser or they sent out what's called a BPO agent, which is a broker price opinion, which is a realtor who's paid a lousy 50 bucks to determine the value of the home. The bank came out and did that and and that value came back at $29,600. So you can't possibly sell it at $100,000 in the eyes of the bank. Okay. Okay, Is that normal? That much of a difference in price right there? Uh, you know, it's, it's, I, it's hard to say what's normal. I mean, I can tell you that my last four students each made over $100,000 profit on their very first short sale they ever did. Okay. So, so I don't know what, you know, you would call normal, uh, in there. I know that for me for 14 years, um, that's how I got $3 million in cash in my IRAs was from real estate and getting out of the corporate world and working full time and helping families out and doing nothing but short sales for 14 years. And and for me, that's been typical um, with it because I developed a method and a process and a procedure, uh, you know, to require the banks to follow the regulations and to go through a bunch of steps, you know, to arrive and to get to that point. You know, there's a lot of reasons, Jen, why the bank would accept something like that. And if you want, I can give you a couple of reasons why they would accept twenty nine thousand six hundred. If you well, want me to talk I, I, about those, I, you know, I love all this <laughs> stuff. Um, I, I interviewed someone recently and forgive me, whoever it was, but they were talking about, uh, the foreclosures. If a bank gets more than say like 10% foreclosures going on, that's when they try to start selling off all those notes. Uh, is, is that tie in there for anything or, okay. Is that one of the things that you're going to talk about? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Here's how the numbers. So that's why they're, they're quicker to be like, Oh, it's valued at 29,600. You know, they'd rather do that to keep that number down. Okay. Yeah. So you've heard of this thing called fiat currency. No. Uh, The the banking system. Have you heard of the banking system? (laughs) (laughs) So so, let me me have another drink. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah. yeah, Exactly. (laughs) So so 
It's, and that's just for the listeners, okay, uh, you know, who haven't been trained by you, okay? Okay, you, you take a dollar, you give it to the bank, and they give you a toaster, okay? And then the bank uh, is able to loan out $15, okay? And they get this money from the Federal Reserve. They, they print it up, they whip it up in a barrel somewhere. And so, so basically, you know, they have a dollar, they can lend out $15. Well, what happens, Jen, it works in reverse, on a uh, foreclosure on a short sale is that on a non-performing note, it reverses. So if they have a $100,000 loan and they're missing payments and it's non-performing note, then it reverses and they have to take one and a half million dollars off huh. their books that they can't go out there and lend it like say 8% to other people. So yeah, they, 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 if they take this loss, which wasn't their money to begin with, okay, then that loss is not on their books as non-performing. And that, and so even if they take, say, $50,000 or whatever, they get to go back out and lend $750,000 at 8% interest. So they so they absolutely want to get that off their books. The other one is, you know, Silicon Valley Bank. We've heard of that, right? Right. Like you just said, too many of those yep. Not, you know, too many quantities of too many loans not performing gets them shut down. And guess what? That's like you know the 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 big bad boy brother government comes in and takes their their toys away. They don't. They're not a bank anymore. They took all their toys away and they shut them down. And and, and that's the last thing a bank wants to do is have all their toys taken away and get shut down and, and not be a bank anymore. So there's lots of reasons. Um, there's others too, even um, from the, well, you know, this is kind of interesting on a perspective, even within the world of, of a full appraisal, let's take FHA. So I'm going to give some, maybe some, maybe secret numbers so people can write this down. Okay. Uh, and stuff, or, or, or you know, don't, you know, don't write it if you're driving please okay but <laughs> just, you know, just re-listen to the podcast when you get to a safe place but let's take an fha loan uh jen fha loan does a, what's called a real true actual full appraisal by the books uh, a normal one not a broker price opinion which is exactly what it says where an, a real estate agent says I, my opinion is it's worth this but rather fha loans fha short sales they do a full appraisal. Now, even in that, they don't want that number. That's not the value they want. But wait a minute, you just did an appraisal and you said it was worth, say, $100,000. Well, that's not actually what they'll take. Their guidelines actually say 88%. If you wait 30 days, it's 86%. Wait another 30 days yeah. and it's 84%. Okay, so write those numbers down. Don't offer the appraisal, okay? Do a percentage of it based on you know the amount of time it's been. So the, and so that's you know three good reasons you know why banks you know will take you know the the values that they do. All right, I have to take a breath to get this all in my brain because, like I said, I've heard you speak before, and I'm like, oh, this is amazing, and then it's in one ear and out the other. So, um, I want to now get into the investor side of things. So, I mean, I feel bad for the homeowner that this is going on. Um, you know, but you are helping them out of a situation where you're taking it off their hands. It's no longer a financial burden. And it takes, you said, three, four, five, six months for a short sale to go through. So they're living there without having to pay mortgage payments, correct? And right. they're able to save up some money to make a fresh start somewhere else. So that makes me feel a little bit better about this. Okay. Um, now, how do investors find short sales? Because they're not on the MLS. Well, that's real easy that, you know, they could text bad to my phone number and get a video that shows you the website. Okay. But is this the black the question, night thing? No, it's oh. not. No, no. This, this is my video that I did that shows you where to find short sales <laughs> uh, in the video. So what I teach people, okay. For people, you know, writing this down or, or, you know, don't have the video is that um, you go. So, so let's back up the, uh, a, a foreclosure, all across the country by law must be posted in the county legal newspaper okay now this isn't your sun times or your you know uh you know uh, the herald or whatever this, every county has a legal newspaper where contracts government contracts divorces 
foreclosures are posted in that legal newspaper. And so what I teach people to do is to go to the internet version of their county legal newspaper. And then there, they have to be posted for a certain number of days. So in Missouri, that has to be posted for 21 days straight. Uh, Georgia, it's 30 days. Uh, you know, uh, Illinois is 90 days. Each uh, state is a little bit different in the number of days. But I teach people to go to the Internet version of the county legal newspaper and get the names and addresses of those people. And, of course, mail them on day one. Don't wait till day 20. Right. But mail them on day one a letter with your phone number in it and have them call you. It's really simple. Direct mail is one of the oldest. It's like death and taxes. You know, direct mail has been around forever. Right? I so, love uh, direct mail. Don't get me started. That's still my all time <laughs> favorite. It's I, I just bought a 12 unit up in Southern Virginia be, through direct mail. So I, I'm a big believer in direct mail. Um, and I, I really quickly while we we're taking a quick little break here, but you're going to text the word bad B-A-D to the phone number. 636-685-2990. And that video will be there on how they can find short sales. I love that. I I use RealFlow, a version of RealFlow where it pulls those pre-foreclosures. Is it people that are in foreclosure or pre-foreclosures? Um, so these are people that have a foreclosure date. Okay. They are not foreclosed on. Now, a lot of those, and, and I know the people, you know, those are good softwares, but I will tell you that you want to use what's in my video because you need to get it before those using RealFlow. <laughs> That's a very right? excellent point because you know? I, I mail to pre-foreclosures. I have several times in the past and I will get, my, and my message is very generic. Hey, thinking of selling, we buy your house as is, we close on your timeline, We whatever. And instead of, hey, I hear you suck at making payments, give me a call and let me help you with it. it nothing in there talks about the pre-foreclosure or anything, it's just super generic. So I get a lot of calls from my pre-foreclosure mailers because I'm a little different than the other ones that they're getting. So I hear that a lot. Why, why am I getting 10 postcards a day from these investors? So that's interesting. And also with RealFlow, and I'm, I'm, I have an affiliate with RealFlow. I love them. I've been using them for years, but it's as good as the county sends it up to that company to get that information. So I think it's great. This whole, um, you know, paper out there that has these or the internet version, as you said, to, to get a jump on that list. Cause that's a very, very important list. So you have one of your bullet points in here, or did you want to add anything else to that? Cause, no, no, okay, fine. perfect. So you add on here, how, one of your bullet points that you said that you're going to talk about was how there are no other buyers allowed on a short sale. What is that nuggetage? Oh gosh, this is really um, mind blowing. It, it's a fundamental shift. Uh, so, so the people that have the most trouble with that statement are licensed realtors, okay? And and licensed realtors are very important. They're on my team. I am not a realtor, an attorney, an accountant. I'm not even an actor for one. I'm just a regular entrepreneur, okay? Uh, and so, so licensed realtors have been trained to protect the broker, right, from lawsuits. And so realtors are following guidelines that are given, um, you know, for many of those purposes. Uh, with it. And so when I say there are no other buyers, a realtor's first mindset, and, and I'm using uh, a generalization. So for those realtors, you know, that says, that's not like me, that's great. Okay. But uh, the general realtor, the traditional realtor is going to do open houses, put vanilla in the microwave, uh, you know, <laughs> put mums right? on the front porch. Exactly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so but, but see in a short sale is totally different. Um, and, and then, and the realtor actually will make this mistake that's even worse. The, 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 they know there's a missed payment, a foreclosure potential situation coming up. So they'll list the home for what the loan value is. Okay. Uh, which is actually a mistake because you only get like 90% of right. the list price anyway. So you've already missed that part. Uh, but then uh, the fact should be that the home should be listed for its value, not the mortgage. So now you can't find any buyers. So a lot of times uh, homeowners are disenfranchised by what I call the traditional realtor. So now with that background caveat, okay, when I make that statement, there are no other buyers. It's because of this. 
uh, you know, um, let's let's try it this way. We live in America. The homeowner owns the house, right? We're in America. That's their house, and they still own it. I don't care if they missed a payment or not. That still belongs to them. So here's my statement. That homeowner can sell that house to who they dadgum well please. That's the end of your story, okay? We are not trying to find 10 buyers, 20 buyers out there. The homeowner has talked to you on the phone. They want you to be the buyer. Got We're it. done with it. We write a purchase sell contract. Boom. There are no other buyers, right? So we don't go to uh, 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 open house and try and bring people, you know, into the house and get higher bids. You know, that that's the one of the mistakes that a realtor makes is that, that they go out there and they try to prove to the bank and they try to get the bank the highest price. Now, think about this. A licensed realtor will agree with me that when they sign a listing agreement with the homeowner, that they have signed a fiduciary responsibility to who? The homeowner, Correct. right? Not to the bank. So why are they trying to get the highest price possible for the bank when instead they're supposed to be getting the best financial situation for the homeowner? Okay, that's who they're representing. Okay, so so if the bank... If the bank thinks the house is worth X amount of money and that number is a really low value, just really low, then it doesn't make it really easy for a realtor to find a buyer at a number higher than that. Yes. So you, uh, a realtor should be trying to try, should be trying to make the bank say that they want a low number back, not a high number. So, so in other words, a realtor should be trying, and, I don't, and the word convince is not wrong because there's no convincing in this, but basically realtors work so hard to try to keep finding a higher and a higher and higher buyer and the bank keeps rejecting and rejecting it. Instead, if the realtor would send the bank a repair estimate of the house, you know, and show them that there's all these problems with it, you know, then the bank, you know, would back off a little bit on that price you know, conceptually. And so that's why there are no other buyers because the homeowner has chosen to sell it to you. Okay. So they have chosen to sell to you. Do they give you permission to speak to the bank on their behalf to do yes, the negotiation? Before you, yes. It's called an, an ATR form, authorization to release information form. You as the investor entrepreneur doesn't do anything in the short sale process other than get the homeowner to sign that form first, okay? Then that lets you send it to the bank and talk to the bank and find out all about the specifics, the type of loan, the, the requirements for the short sale, what's needed, and then you can package that and go back to the homeowner and say, okay, look, I need two months bank statements, two pay stubs, a uh, hardship letter, and these things, and then you work with the homeowner to get those documents and give it to the bank. They never talk to the bank again. Got you're it. talking with the bank the entire time. You're given the purchase sale contract. You're given the repair estimate. You're given the CMAs, da, 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 you know, to the bank, not the homeowner with that authorization form. Okay. So kind of switching gears here. How does one finance a short sale that if you are purchasing a short sale? Oh, that's another good myth about short sales people have. You have to pay cash for the house right? I don't have any cash. And so a lot of people don't do short sales because of that. That is wrong, dead wrong again. Okay. So, so yes, you turn in your purchase sale contract cash as is. Turn that in to the bank. But as you know, as a, as a licensed realtor, you know this, Jen, that you can always come to closing with a loan. Every state in the United States, every city and their purchase sale says you can come to closing with a loan. So you turn the offer in as cash as is for the short sale purpose and negotiating with the bank. But when you come to the closing table, you as the buyer can get a hard money loan. You can get you know any kind of loan. Just you know, don't change the price and don't change the terms you know of the contract. Okay. So so you I, I don't. I've got three million dollars in cash in my IRAs. I don't come to closing with cash. I borrow money myself. Okay. <laughs> really? No, I do because I believe uh, there's many reasons why I believe that. Um, you know, one reason is I want to keep my cash 
in the bank ready to go. Um, and, you know, if you have a, a lender, a hard money lender, it's a second set of eyes, you know, looking at the deal. But but anyway, you know, you and then you want this encumbrance on your property, you know, for future lawsuits by someone tripping, you know, if you've got a loan on it, then, you know, there's lots of many mm. discussions there. But you you come to closing with a hard money loan. Um, and then you can refinance that out if you're going to make it a rental. Um, you know, you can rehab it or do whatever you want. But no, you don't need your cash. You need cash, but not yours. Very good to know. And for a property, so going back to this house that was um, 204000 is what was owed on the loan. And you got it for 29600 And you said you can't change anything in the contract that you can, you know, bring a hard money loan to finance it at the closing. What about repairs? Because normally I have a hard money loan will include repairs as well. So do you have to do that separately, get a separate loan for that, a construction loan say, or how do you do if, if this property needs repairs before you go to list it? That's a great question. Um, amazing. No one's ever asked me really? that question. Yeah. Uh, and I've been on many, many podcasts. So, so so what happens is, and people can contact me, you know, later to really go through like, you know, technically how you how you make this look. But on the HUD statement, what happens is, uh, and so you're going to get a, you're going to, you're going to need the twenty nine thousand six hundred dollars to close on the purchase, but you need say eighty thousand to do the rehab. Right. So on the HUD statement, on the buyer side, you're going to have a loan of like a hundred thousand. OK, uh, whatever that adds up to. OK, that's the loan value. But then down below, you're going to say funds held by the lender of 80. OK, and so so that leaves the twenty nine thousand, you know, for the purchase price. So you've got a loan, you've got a deed of trust from the you know, for the, our mortgage, okay, for the lender at the $100,000 price. Uh, but he's just going to do the disbursement and draws after closing. Okay. Got it. All right. And thank you for clarifying that because when you said the contract had to stay the same, I was like, oh, but I want to do repairs and I don't want to come out of pocket for that. So this is fantastic, David. And you heard me give a badassery bestowment at the beginning, which is a little nugget. Do you have something that you can share with the audience members? Uh, well, yeah, you know, I think that um, right now um, we have 2 million delinquent loans in this country from the pandemic. Now we have that 2 million increasing because of this thing called inflation <laughs> and the 30 day, uh, 60 day lates are increasing that there are a lot of families out there that need your help. Okay. To stop their crisis in a foreclosure type situation where you can help them and you can make huge amounts of profit for your family. Four students who never did a short sale made a hundred grand on their first one. The banks are dumping their houses. So my bestowment thing is that and and text the word bad and get a video that explains the short sale process and how to find them. Okay. So th those two things. I mean, I love all this, David, and I appreciate you sharing this. The in real estate, what I've learned in the short six years I've been doing real estate investing is you have to be ready to pivot. And if there was any time in history to pivot in real estate, this is the time. And listeners working with short sales, helping homeowners, they they need your help. So once again, that phone number, you're going to text BAD, B-A-D, to 636 685 two nine nine zero and david is the man he will guide you through this and you're also a hard money lender too so <laughs> you can even help with the funding side of things so david thank you so much for everything on this portion i want to jump to the second part of the podcast is which is what makes david randolph a badass and excuse me the david randolph.com a badass and the first letter is b for book what's a book that's made a huge difference in your life you know it's strange i uh, sometimes i hate to say it because everybody else does but you know the <laughs> Really, but but it's actually true though. It is it is the rich dad poor dad book. Um, you know, for all the stuff about it, it's what gave me the impetus to look into the non corporate world, 
oh my gosh, you know, I was so stuck in that, right? You know, we, we're taught to, to go to college and get a job and work for somebody else. And, 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 I, and yes, I was blessed to be an engineer, but, you know, many people, you know, are put into this corporate world working for somebody else, barely, you know, scraping by. And then that book opened my eyes to the non-corporate world and, and into real estate. So, so for me, it's, it's, you know, it's that book. And yes, a lot of people say it, but there's a reason for it because so many people relate to that story. Do you, do you ever play, um, the, what cash flow? Is it the game called cash flow or get out of the rat race? What, what is the game called? Have you ever played that cash flow cash flow? Yes. <sighs> that is so I've played that with a group of investors and there's five of us and you play the game, how you actually invest in your business. It is hilarious. I have one person was like, buy it, buy it, buy it. And then at the end he, anyway, had so much, was carrying so much risk. And I'm like, yep, that's exactly how his business is. It was very funny. So anyway, I, I absolutely love that book. And listeners, I'm telling you, if you haven't read it yet, get out there and do it. All right. The first A in badass is for advice. What's, you gave us some great advice. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? You know, I think that the best advice I received, um, it's made a huge difference in my life is, is, you know, education's important, but it's really relationships. So my advice is to build relationships to people. You know, I used to go to these RIA meetings mm -hmm. you know, and I go to many RIA meetings and I would go to the meeting with one little nugget, little trick, little secret that I learned somewhere. And, and I would share it with 10 different people and they'd be like, oh, wow, man, I can't believe you told me that. That's really cool. Then they, guess what, Jen, they would share something with me. Now I walked out of that meeting giving away one secret and got 10. <laughs> so it's about relationships and building that relationship with other investors and the homeowner. You know, you're, you're not buying houses, you're solving people problems. Okay. And build relationships with that, with people. Real estate is relationships. And I was just telling you before we hit record on here that I was at an accountability luncheon today with a group of people that I meet with every other Thursday. And someone was talking about short sales. I'm like, I am interviewing the man of short sales. And they said, is that the, is that David Randolph? Because they had heard you speak. But um, yes, it, and it is one of those things where you get these little nuggets here and there and you're like, ah, oh, absolutely. And on the flip side of that, reason why I started this accountability group and going tying into the whole thing about relationships is real estate can be very lonely. If you are sitting behind a computer looking up short sales or your private money lender and you're lending money out, it's just, it, it can be very lonely. So you do, you want to attend your local RIAs, you want to attend conferences and it just makes all the difference in the world. And you are so right. And everybody in this, well, 93% in this industry want to help people along. And you have definitely been very successful, which is why you're giving away these videos for free. And uh, you have created your own educational program. And I want to take a quick little sidebar here because you said something in the beginning about some of these education programs you'll sign up for and then they upsell you. They upsell you. It's always about the upsell, but you have created from A to Z all in one stop shop, correct? Yes. So yeah. give, so, us, give know, a quick shout out to your education program here real quick. Well, it's, it's really cool. I spent um, hundreds of thousands of dollars on education in the beginning. I mean, I went really, you know, maybe even overboard with that and, and I hated it every time I bought something, I got to the end and I could actually do none of it unless I bought something else. And it's like, oh, nuts. Hence, I spent a lot of money. And so when, when, when uh, about four years ago, when, when a lot of uh, people out there in the industry who know me said, David, you need to teach other people how you're doing that for 14 years, I got to then create my own online education portal to do that. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I get to create it. I'm going to make it A to Z, the entire short sale process. Everything that you need to know how to do a short sale with somebody in foreclosure. You don't need any other course. You don't need any other system. Uh, and, and so I was able to create a Kajabi online portal on my website uh, that is actually cool because it's evergreen. It's got, you know, where you can watch it around the clock. And then I do updates with it. OK, as COVID went along and different things. So it's not like a CD on your shelf, you know, <laughs> gathering dust, but rather it's live 
And so I can, you know, add to it. So I really love that. Um, I've got a lot of successful people uh, like Arnie Newton in, in, uh, in Arkansas did his first deal and wholesaled it for $40,000. You know, his very first one on it didn't do anything to it. And then he did 14 more after that last year, you know, just from taking the, the basic workshop uh, on there. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it is meant uh, to teach you, you know, all the steps that you need. Now, I will admit, though, Jen, it, it does stop it when you buy the house, okay? So, so it doesn't teach you to be a landlord, to rehab it. It's only the short sale process. And the thought was, if you're buying a house for $29,600, you can probably figure out what to do with it from there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you for sharing all that. All right, and how do they find your course? Uh, if they go to my website, the, you know, T-H-E, and then David Randolph, that's O-L-P-H, the David Randolph.com, and just go to trainings, workshops, scroll down, and there's that basic workshop right there, uh, and they can sign up for it, and it'll teach you everything everything you need. You can get support through it directly, um, and, and even if you don't get the course, okay, and you decide not to, if you run across a short sale and you want some help to help that family out, feel free to call me anytime, you know, uh, you know, I want to help families out. That's why my wife right. and I started doing that. So, so if you run across somebody, you know, and, and you don't want to learn to help them, then please, you know, call me and let me see if there's some way I can help them. Wonderful. See, I knew I just really liked you, Mr. St. Louis as well. So, cause both my parents went to Mizzou. So go, I'm black and gold myself. Anyway, I digress. All right, <laughs> going back to the acronym here, the D in badass is for drive. What drives David to be successful? Wow, um, food. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like to eat. Uh, and so, and so, so when I go to conferences, I'm always eating out with people on it. No, you know, and I think my, my, my drive is that I'm trying to um, take my knowledge and impart it to other. You know, I'm going to die one day, okay? And 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 I and can I sit here in a hole and make all this money? I, and yes, I have. I mean, I've got three million dollars in cash in my IRAs that I that I lend out, and and that's just money that my wife didn't see. You know, I made a lot more than that. It's what <laughs> stuck faster. You know, <laughs> and she's listening on this, but. Yeah, but uh, but so but you know, but you know so you can sit in a hole and do that or you can try and help you know other people so my drive is to teach other people how to do this and help families out look i can make a hundred thousand dollars here and you can make a hundred thousand dollars on your house and it doesn't affect either one of us there isn't competition you know in this short sale uh, area we need to be helping families out with it. And so my drive is to be able to teach a thousand people across the country, you know, to be able to, you know, do that. I love it. Real estate is not pie. Like you get a piece of the pie, you get a piece of the pie. Everybody gets pie. So I love everything you just said there. All right. The second A in badass is aspiration. I'm a big goal setter. So what is a goal you are currently working on? Well, I think that goal is that one to basically get a thousand millionaires uh, from the short sale method out there. It's very easy to become a millionaire. And so I want my, my aspiration right now is to hit 1,000 people that become millionaires using the short sale system. Now, can those thousand people still work, work a full-time job? Um, yeah, I often tell people, don't quit your day job. <laughs> Because in a short sale, there's not that much work. I did an entire short sale all the way through in two months and, and recorded on Zoom for my students. You know, I wanted to have any, even my pajamas. It wasn't that very good, but everything was, <laughs> it was 22 hours of work over two months. So, so unless you get like 10 or 12 short sales going on, don't quit your day job. Okay. You know, when you, if you start rehabbing houses and some other things, then, then yeah, quit your job. But if you want to, um, stay at your job because you're doing things that are important to you, then that's fine. Just wholesale the houses off. You don't have to rehab them. Right. I make $80,000 on my wholesales. I make $150,000 profit if I rehab it. You know, just make 80000 and wholesale it. And so, so I think it's your choice. I love it. All right. The first S in badass is for systems. What systems do you have in place to help you achieve success? success oh, wow. If I can you say know, that word. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm all about procedures and systems. You you read it out loud. It's about people, profits, and, and processes uh, and stuff. And so uh, we could be here all evening talking about the systems that I use 
But basically, everything. Let's start with a simple system, which is just a just a, an Excel file and a Microsoft Word file of what you do step by step to be successful in what area of real estate you're at. Then look at that every week and say, what did I do different this week that was successful or not successful? And revise your procedure, your checklist, and your system with it. Um, and then from there, we can add in CRMs and we can add other things to make it one to many and to make it more, you know, faster and to reach out more. But start with just simple systems of, of written procedures of what you do in your process, uh, you know, and then and, and just put a timeline on that. Very well said. All right. This has been so fun, David. I am going to wrap this up here with the final S in badass. And it's the word success. What does success mean to you? Wow. Um, that's, you know, I, I think for me, success is being able to leave something to my family. Okay. You know, we, we struggle in America and it's getting harder and harder for families today in America to, to, to even be able to keep their heads above water. What if you, if I consider myself successful, if I could leave a legacy to my wife, my children, and their children to keep their head above water in America from the beginning so that they didn't get kicked down from the very beginning and, and, and be in a, in a tough financial situation. It's so tough in America to be able to afford things. Um, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, you should try to keep up with the Joneses. You don't need to, but even just a standard living is tough in this country. Uh, and, and if you don't have a job, oh my gosh, that's even worse. So so for me, success is being able to, to leave a legacy to my family so that each one of my kids and their grandkids are starting with the ability to financially be not free, okay, but not, you know, underground or, you know, sub, you know, you know, a, a poverty level type system with it, you know, they have the ability to make choices to invest in businesses, uh, to go to college if they want to, you know, both my children went to college, you know, homeschooling, just a quick note on that, you know, our public schools were so bad here, Jen, that, you know, and then there's many other reasons to homeschool that people have, but, you know, my, both my kids got scholarships that literally paid for them to go to college. Right. So even though they, they homeschooled, they still went to college. Uh, they paid my son a thousand dollars a month after room and board to go to college wow. because of homeschooling uh, and stuff. And so, and so basically, you know, let, you know, family, my, my family members have that choice of, of what they want to do. Well, I think you are fabulous, David. Thank you so much for being on the show. And just a quick reminder, that number for the third time, get your pen and paper. It's 636 685 Two nine nine zero, and you want to text bad or go to the David Randolph R A N D O L P H dot com and check out his evergreen course. I love it, David. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you very much, Jen. Absolutely, I hope I get to see you in uh, Columbia again sometime soon. So, have, thank you so much, and that is all. Thank you for listening, and we will catch you on the next episode. Now, go out there and share your badassery, and don't forget, make it a great day. Take care. Bye bye. Whoop whoop. Thank you for listening to Rain, the Real Estate Investor Growth Network. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. If you need more badassery, you can follow Jen Josie by visiting therealgenjosie.com or become a member of Rain by registering on rainmastermind.com.